Hello everyone, this is Dr. Demi and in this video I am going to start revising the May-June 2021 exams for the October-November group. So for those of you who are writing this year in October-November, you are the last group that will be writing with this syllabus and the group writing in 2022 will be writing from an updated syllabus. But never worry, the changes are not really hectic and you can always go on the channel and just look for the video I did on changes to the CAIE syllabus for 2022. For those of you writing next month, uh, which is more or less three weeks away, I hope that you have been preparing and I hope that you know that the best preparation is for you to do as many past papers as possible. One of the things I usually advise students to do if they're preparing for the exams is to practice every single paper from the last three or four years in order for them to be well prepared. I am not going to go through every single paper from those years. What I will do, however, is prepare these videos from the May June 2021 exams to show you what to expect and what your peers faced when they wrote the exam. The exception to this is paper three. Of course, as you might already know, I can't do paper three exams because they are practical. And so you have to work with your teacher or maybe attach yourself to a school and get practice on how to do the lab experiment. One of the limiting factors to this exam, um, to recording that exam paper in particular, is that we need to collect data, which is something that I am not equipped to do considering where I currently work. Um, I don't work in a school at the moment, um, so I can't help with that. So I hope that you're able to set that up with your teachers or attach yourself to a school if you're a homeschooled student, because it is really important. What I will do, however, is revise the May June 2021 papers one to four, and I will only be doing the variant one um, of each paper. Something else I'd like to say to you is that it is important for you to practice the other variants. And if you have questions while you're practicing, then you can ask them in the comments and I will be able to explain to you. But I will not be able to do videos of every single paper. So from variant one to three, for example, I won't be able to do that. I'll only do variant one of each paper. Okay, then let's get into this. This is paper one, um, the May June 2021 exam, and we will get to see what your peers faced when they wrote this exam. So this question says the diagram shows a mitochondrion drawn from an electron micrograph. The actual length of the mitochondrion using the line X to Y is 3000 nanometers. What is the magnification of the drawing of the mitochondrion? First things first, always bear in mind that magnification is equal to image size over actual size. Okay. Um, in this case, you've been given the actual length, so which would classify as the actual size, and that is 3000 nanometers. So I'm just going to write that here, 3000 nanometers. All right. Now, in this case, because you're working or you're calculating magnification and magnification doesn't have any units, um, there's no reason for me to be underlining that. So please don't take that as a special thing. Magnification doesn't have any units, so you can work with whatever unit you're given. In order for you to get the image size, you will have to use your ruler. You have to use your ruler to calculate what the length is from this point here to that point there. Now, before I started recording, I did that uh, measurement and I got three centimeters. So it means that my I is equal to three centimeters. Now, obviously, I know that I can't take three centimeters and divide it by 3000 nanometers because that would not be accurate. I need to get centimeters right back to um, right to nanometers so that the units can cancel out. Now, you can do this easily and I'm going to do this step by step for those who might not be very confident with this conversion. If you're going from centimeters to millimeters, you multiply by 10. So it's going to be three times 10. OK, that will give you 30 millimeters. Again, we still don't have the correct unit, so we have to go all the way to nanometers. Now, you know, if you're going from millimeters to micrometers, you multiply by a thousand. And if you're going from micrometers to nanometers, you multiply by another thousand. So in this case, when we multiply all of this, we will have 30 million. Okay, so we have 30 million nanometers. 
Now we are at a position where the two units can cancel each other out and we have three zeros here that cancel out three zeros there. Then we have three that goes in here and that's one and we basically have 10,000. That tells us that our magnification is 10,000 times so the answer here would be C. If you found that confusing just post it in the comments and I will respond. Let's look at question two. A specimen of plant tissue is observed twice using a microscope, is observed twice with a microscope. Firstly, using red light with a wavelength of 650 nanometers and then using green light with a wavelength of 510 nanometers. What happens to the magnification and resolution when using green light compared to red light? Now, green light and red light offer different levels of visibility. But what they are unable to do is affect magnification. So irrespective of the wavelength that you're using, the magnification will stay the same. So in this case, and I, I bet this might not be something you're aware of, so I hope you've taken note of that. In this case, that means that when we are looking at the options that we have, here it says magnification decreases and increases. We know that options A and B cannot be our answers. But we do see that for C and D, it mentions that the magnification um, remains the same. So we know that our answer is either C or D. What we now need to see is resolution. Now, whenever you're dealing with wavelength and um, resolution, the rule is that the shorter the wavelength, so I'm just going to write it, the shorter the wavelength, um, and I think this is the sign for wavelength. I'm not really sure if I'm wrong. Please check that. Um, I haven't done physics in a while. But the shorter the wavelength, the um, higher the resolution. Okay. So whichever one has a shorter wavelength will give a higher resolution. So you can simply then look in this case at the... I'm just going to write resolution that way. You can look in this case at the wavelength. So um, a red light has 650 nanometers while the green light has 510 nanometers. And the question says what happens to magnification and resolution when using green light compared to red light? So you are checking the characteristic for green light. We already said that magnification cannot be affected because irrespective of the wavelength, the size or the magnification would stay the same. However, what will change will be the resolution. So in this case, because green light has the shorter wavelength, it means that it will increase the resolution. And that means your answer here would be D. All right. I hope that was clear. Okay, now let's look at question three. And just by the way, for your paper one, you have 40 questions and you have to answer every 40, every single one of them. So for those of you writing in October, November, you have one hour to complete this paper. So please, please practice doing timed tests so that you don't find yourself running short of time and then playing any mini many more as time goes on. I also want to point out here a theory I have heard from my students in the past where they say that if you don't know the answer in a multiple choice paper, just select C. That is not true. C is not always the default response when you don't know. You have to test what you know against the options that you're given in order to get the correct answer and you will see me do that very frequently as we go on in this paper. So let's look at question three here. It says the electron micrograph shows a structure found in the cytoplasm of an animal cell. What is this cell structure? Now when you look at this I'm sure some of you are like what on earth is that? That was my exact reaction, but then I went back and I read the question again. It said, it shows a structure found in the cytoplasm of an animal cell. Sometimes uh, CIE papers, are they use English. Sometimes they use English. Let me put it this way. They use English to confuse you or to lead you in the direction that you should go. So if you look at this, you can't necessarily tell what it is. I mean, you can tell it's not a ribosome, but you don't know if it's not a lysosome. You don't know if it's not a vesicle. Nobody knows what it is. Um, well, I don't simply by looking at it. So what I did in this case was focus on the fact that it said it is found in the cytoplasm of an animal cell. What is it that is found in an animal cell but is not in a plant cell? That is actually a centriole. And so I decided to go with option A and it turned out to be correct. You can find a lysosome in a plant cell, you can find ribosomes in plant cells, and you can find vesicles in plant cells. So that is a trick that you can employ if you look at something and you're not really sure on how to approach the question. 
Let's look at four. It says which cell structures contain nucleic acid. Now bear in mind that your nucleic acids are your DNA and your RNA. All right. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA is ribonucleic acid. So the question is simply asking you where, which one of these structures would have DNA or RNA or even both in them. First of all, you can't find DNA or RNA in the Golgi body. DNA um, in particular stays in the nucleus, so there's no way you would find it in the Golgi body. What you find in the Golgi body are primary structures of proteins that are being folded and modified before they are released to be exported out of the cell. So that is not DNA or RNA. The lysosome doesn't contain DNA or RNA. It is a digestive um, organelle in the cell that helps to digest unwanted material. So that can't be it. The mitochondria, that's a very good one. The mitochondria does contain DNA and it can contain RNA as well. And this is simply because of what we call the endosymbiont theory. Please don't forget this theory because these questions are usually brought up um, and students tend to fail them because they forget about it. The endosymbiont theory simply suggests that mitochondria and chloroplasts used to exist on their own as cells, as living cells or living organisms. And so because of that, they have their own DNA and they have their own protein synthesis machinery. However, after a while, our cells, being the eukaryotic cells engulfed the mitochondria and the chloroplast and as a result of that they now exist within us but they did not lose this characteristic that they had as prokaryotic organisms so certainly in your mitochondria you will find dna and if you go and look at the videos that i did i believe it's on chapter 17 or 18 one of the two where we speak about mitochondrial dna um, you will remember that mitochondria has dna so that's certainly an option um, ribosomes also will definitely have RNA because remember, whenever you're doing protein synthesis, what happens is that RNA polymerase goes into the nucleus, it copies the DNA to make mRNA, and that mRNA would then be carried to the ribosomes where they are translated into primary protein structures that then go to the Golgi body um, to be folded and modified. So your ribosomes will contain RNA. And so we know that three and four are the correct answers and so we just go with D. Another way you could have approached this is simply looked out for the options that had one and two and just said, well, because we know that there is no way these two can ever contain um, nucleic acid, those options are wrong. And that might have led you to your answer a lot quicker. But it's always good to explain um, in case you're having more difficulty. Let's look at five. Um, here it says, which statements about mitochondria, chloroplast, or prokaryotes are correct? Okay, so here, number one, mitochondria and chloroplast have a fully permeable inner membrane and a partially permeable outer membrane. This is not true. Okay. Um, the cell membrane is um, usually, so they do have two membranes, just by the way, I'm just going to put that out there. For example, with the mitochondria, you might often see drawn um, this way. Again, my drawing, my abysmal drawing ability catches up with me on these videos. Um, so this, you might see the mitochondria drawn like this, where it is said to have two membranes, which is what it does, um, just like the animal cell. But there is nothing that suggests that the one membrane is more permeable than the other. As a matter of fact, the membranes are selectively permeable, um, both. So that means one cannot be correct. Prokaryotes and chloroplasts have 70S ribosomes that are the sites for translation and polypeptide synthesis. Always remember that the polypeptide is more or less the primary structure of the protein. So that is correct based on what I explained on the previous question, that these organisms, um, prokaryotes and chloroplasts, and even mitochondria are said to have existed on their own. So they have their own DNA and their own protein synthesis machinery. And so for that reason, two would be correct. Prokaryotes and mitochondria have an outer membrane and an inner folded membrane where ATP synthesis occurs. Now, this is something that is bound to confuse a lot of students because it is correct for mitochondria, but it is not correct for all prokaryotes. All right, that is something you must bear in mind when you are reading this. It says prokaryotes and mitochondria. It doesn't say prokaryotes or mitochondria. So because it says and, you can't 
get this statement as correct. You can't take it as correct, rather, because it, this is true for mitochondria, but not true for all prokaryotes. For example, some prokaryotes um, are bacteria. They are not mitochondria. And bacteria don't necessarily produce ATP in their inner membrane. As a matter of fact, some of them have what we call a peptidoglycan cell wall. So this means that this cannot be accurate for both. The last one says prokaryotes and mitochondria have circular DNA where genes coding for information are located. That is true. And if you remember the characteristics of prokaryotes from the very first um, chapter, you will remember that we spoke about how they have secular DNA um, and some of them, and they also have naked DNA. It is the same for mitochondria. And so based on this, our correct answer is D, which is numbers two and four. Let's move on to six. The very large, and it tells us the size here, 1,000 nanometer Pandora viruses found in Chile and Australia are considered to be viruses because they cannot replicate their own genome and cannot make proteins. They also share essential structural features with other viruses. What are the essential structural features of viruses? Now, this is a very easy question, but again, I do find that students might become confused just looking at this. Um, viruses, it's just asking you what the characteristics of viruses are. You know that viruses are non-cellular, or in some cases, you might see it written as acellular. What this means is that viruses don't have cells per se, or you, they don't have cells at all, never mind per se. They don't have cells. They don't have anything that helps them code for proteins. They don't have any functionality whatsoever. What they have is a protein code, which is here, and either DNA or RNA. Viruses don't have both, or should we rather say we haven't discovered a virus that has both DNA and RNA. They would either have DNA or RNA, um, and they would have protein codes, and they are acellular, and that leads us obviously to the option B as the correct answer. Let's look at seven. We still have a long way to go, but I hope that you are not losing attention and you are sort of enjoying this. By the way, paper one is my favorite paper. And I know many of my students, some of which might be watching this, some of whom rather might be watching these videos, would be irritated with me when they hear me say that because they tend to hate paper one and I don't understand why. But let's look at question seven. So question seven here says that a sample of food was heated with Benedict's solution which changed color to green. A second sample of the same food was boiled with dilute hydrochloric acid and neutralized using sodium hydrogen carbonate. Sodium hydrogen carbonate. It was then heated with Benedict's solution which changed color to red. Which, what did these results show? Now, something I tell students, and I usually give this to my students as a printout for them to stick in their notebooks, is that when you are going into papers one and two, and even paper three, you must know the different food tests. You must remember what each food test is. And in particular, I believe that the food tests for proteins are quite easy to remember because it's the biuret bio test. In particular, you must know the difference between the reducing sugar test and the non-reducing sugar test because once you know that um, then you would be able to um, to answer your questions properly the reducing sugar test is basically a test for glucose so when you're doing a reducing sugar test you just take the sample you add your benedict solution and you boil it and you look out for a color change which is what was done here at the beginning Okay, so this um, was, it was heated with magnetics and it changed color. For the non-reducing sugar, you are probably checking for something like sucrose. Now, you know that sucrose is a disaccharide. Well, if you didn't, I hope that now you do, which means that it is two monosaccharides joined together. And in order for you to um, get an understanding or get a positive result, you have to break the bonds between those two monosaccharides. And in order to do that, what you do is that you treat it with hydrochloric acid, which would help to break the bond. You neutralize the reaction, and then you add Benedict to check for the presence of these tests. So with that said, looking at these options, Option A is telling us glucose is present um, and then non-reducing sugar is present. That could be correct because, um, again, glucose is a reducing sugar. However, that wasn't specified. So it could be any other reducing sugar. It could be fructose, for example. So you can't choose A as your answer in case you've already done that. You have to go and look for where reducing sugar and non-reducing sugar overlap. And that is over here at C.
All right, and that would be the correct answer for question seven. I hope that makes sense. So again, you don't, you shouldn't make assumptions. Um, it would be correct to say glucose because glucose is a reducing sugar, but because you have this option here that says specifically reducing sugar present, then it means they're telling you that it can't always be glucose. It could be fructose or any other reducing sugar. So your answer here is C. Let's look at eight. Which pair of molecules only includes macromolecules that can be found in animal cells? So macromolecules that you would find in animal cells, um, for example, amylase and am amylase. Okay, I'm, I'm expecting that should be amylose, but if it says amylase, that is an enzyme, um, an amylopectin. So an enzyme is indeed a macromolecule because enzymes are proteins. Amylopectin is a constituent of starch, and you do find starch in plant cells, so that can't be your answer. Collagen is something that you find um, under the surface of the skin or it is part of the skin structure. So it is found in animal cell. It is what gives you a plump, um, glowy, not well, not glowy, but a plump complexion. Um, so collagen, definitely. Glycogen is what you convert glucose to um, after you've had um, a good meal. So collagen and glycogen you can certainly found in animal, you can find in animal cells rather. Deoxyribose and starch. Um, animal cells don't store starch. This is only stored in plant cells. So already that tells you that this is wrong. Um, sucrose and hemoglobin. You would find hemoglobin in um, in an animal cell and it is a macromolecule because it's, made, it's a protein. It's a big protein. However, sucrose is a disaccharide. It is not a macromolecule. So just to make it clear, a macromolecule is more or less referring to a giant molecule. So it's maybe something like a polysaccharide, which is what amylopectin and glycogen are. So in this case, this answer would be wrong. And that leads us to the um, selection of B as the correct answer. I hope that was clear. If it wasn't, again, just leave a comment in the chat. So look at number nine and let's maybe try to move a little bit quicker. I try to keep these videos under an hour, but if it goes above an hour, I hope that you're still able to follow through to the end and that you are also trying to work out the problems as we go along. Homogalacto, hmm, homogalacto Okay, that molecule is a polysaccharide found in plant cell walls, and the diagram shows a molecule of the monomer used to form that molecule, the giant molecule. A student studied the structure of this monomer and compared it with the structure um, of the monomer used to form cellulose. Which carbon atoms in the monomer in the diagram have hydroxyl groups arranged in different positions to those found in the cellulose monomer? So first things first, what is the monomer that makes up cellulose? That monomer is beta glucose. Okay, so beta alpha glucose, um, for example, looks um, something like this. And carbon number one, you have this there, um, the hydroxyl group, and then you have sort of an alternating of the different groups. And you also have over here, this is maybe CH2OH, um, which is a little bit different here. If you're not paying a lot of attention on glucose, this is CH2OH. Just want to point that out to you so that you don't think, well, but this is just glucose. No, it's not. Um, so it says um, on beta glucose, we know that beta glucose has a structure that looks something like this. Um, and I'm going to try to draw it as quickly as possible. And again, what this just um, indicates is how important it is for you to know your glucose structures. So on beta glucose, the OH group is on top on carbon number one again if you don't know how to number the carbons please watch the videos on chapter two because those would be very helpful for you so this is carbon number one and then we know that there's an h group here um so already we can see the difference the oh group is on top on carbon number one and on this monomer here it is at the bottom all right um so we already know that carbon number one is certainly one of the ones we have to look at and to make it quick you can just go then and eliminate um, C and D because they don't have carbon number one. So you can just say, well, these can't possibly be the answers. So let's keep going. And then if you keep going on beta glucose, you will see over here um, that H and then OH. So that's the same as this monomer on carbon number three. You have OH and you have H here, which is the same as the monomer as well. And then when you go to carbon number four, 
you have H on top on beta glucose and you have OH at the bottom. All right. And over here, you can see that that is a difference. So we see that carbon number four is another difference there. So carbon one and carbon four, and that makes our answer A. So please, please, yes, you do have to know how to draw alpha glucose and beta glucose if you're going into the exams. And the ring structures are usually fine. You don't necessarily have to know the structural um, the structural formula, like where you have to draw it out. But sometimes you might be asked that as well. Let's look at 10. And in case you're wondering where 10 is, it just popped up. Which statement is correct for triglycerides and phospholipids? So and, all right, always take note of those things. Here it says a phosphate group is joined to a glycerol molecule. That is not correct in either case, okay? For triglycerides, you have a glycerol molecule and three fatty acids. And for phospholipids, you have a phosphate group and two fatty acids. So that's not true for both. Um, hydrocarbon chains may be saturated or unsaturated. That's definitely true. Saturated means that there are no double bonds in the hydrocarbon chains. And unsaturated means that you might encounter some double bonds. So you might maybe find a double bond there or find another one there. That's what that means. They are polar molecules. Um, that's not true. They could contain three ester bonds. That is only true for triglycerides and not for phospholipids. So this would then be B. Okay, let's have a look at question 11. Which description of collagen is correct? Now, when I looked at this question, I kind of felt bad for my students who wrote in the major exam because I felt like some of them might have been confused by this question in particular um, because some of the descriptions seem very alike. So let's, let's just look at it. Um, option A says a collagen molecule consists of three polypeptide chains. That is correct. Each in the shape of a helix, not necessarily so. Um, the three chains are wound together into a triple helix called a fiber. Um, so that's also not necessarily true. Uh, because you need many of these helices to make a fiber. So not um, one helix makes a fiber. Then a collagen molecule consists of three polypeptide chains. Again, that's true. Each of which is an alpha helix. That's not true. So the collagen molecule doesn't look like this, which is what the alpha helix typically looks like. Again, I'm not blessed with the gift of drawing, but if you go and look at the chapter two videos that I did, um, just go on the playlist tab on the channel, look for chapter two as a playlist and you'll see all the videos on chapter two. So you'll be able to get this properly. Um, but this is not true. So that means A and B are not possible. Then we look at C. It says a collagen molecule consists of three polypeptide chains wound tightly into a triple helix called a fiber. Now, I know why some students might pick this because it is sort of correct that indeed you wind the three polypeptide chains into a sort of triple helix, but that triple helix is not what makes up a fiber. Um, you need many of these triple helices in order to make a fiber. So this would not be the correct answer. And then when we look at D, D says a collagen molecule consists of three polypeptide chains, which we all agree is correct at this point, in which every third amino acid is glycine. That is also correct. The reason the reason why collagen, which by the way is the protein found in your skin, is able to um, bring its three polypeptides close to each other is because of the presence of glycine. Glycine is the smallest amino acid. The three polypeptides are bound tightly together into a triple helix. Many of these helices form a fiber. This is correct. So the answer here would be D. But again, as you can see over here, you would need to do some mental gymnastics in order for you to get to the correct answer. Answer. So I often say if you encounter a question like this and you feel like it's taking too much time, move on to the next question, but have it in mind that you haven't answered this one. Let's look at question 12. Um, this is definitely a calculation question. It says in a, healthy hum in a healthy human, the mean value for the number of hemoglobin molecules in one red blood cell is 260 million. How many alpha globin chains does one red blood cell contain in a healthy human? I love questions like this because they're very easy, very simple. Now let's first of all recall, what is the structure of hemoglobin? Again, if you haven't watched those videos, um, please make sure that you do so. I'm not going to write hemoglobin in full, but we know that hemoglobin is made up of two alpha globins. So I'm just going to write them as glow and it also has two beta globins. So this is in one hemoglobin. 
Okay, now we're being told that we have 260 million hemoglobins. So I'm just going to leave some space between the zeros so you can see them correctly. So if in one hemoglobin there are two alpha globins, in 260 million hemoglobin, you, it would be times two. I hope that makes sense because obviously if one hemoglobin has two, that means each one of these 260 million also has two. So for you to get the value, you need to multiply by two. When you do that multiplication, you are going to get 520 million. And if you move that, so let me just, I'm just going to do this instead of trying to write that out. I'm just going to change this to 520 million. And if you want to count the um, exponential places, it just be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And so that gives us 5.2 exponential eight. And so we know that our answer here then would be C. All right, I hope that was clear enough. Okay, so this question here says, um, which statements about a peptide bond are correct? First things first, know that a peptide bond is the bond that is found between amino acids in the primary structure of a protein. So first of all, it says here, it joins two monomers which are always identical to each other. That's not true. Um, that's not true because your amino acids have varying structures. Um, they have a, a region that is consistent. And again, just to remind you of what that region looks like, the way I explain it in my classroom, I say this is carbo, which is the carboxylic acid group. Um, and carbo is joined by a diamond ring made of carbon to amy, which is the amine group or what some um, books might call the amino group. And then you also have um, over here, it could be Pastor Her um, Herbert, Imam Hamed, whichever religion, um, just substitute that with an H. I'm not going to go into all the details. And then over here, you have a side group that varies. Now, because this side group varies, it means that the monomers are not always identical to each other. For example, in glycine, the side group is H. Okay. But in some other amino acids, you would find that this side group is um, maybe, for example, another amine group. So it could be something that looks like that. So that tells you that they always look different because of the side chain. So that's why one is not correct. Um, a peptide bond contains four different atoms. Um, so that uh, that is technically true. Again, I'm just going to draw this as I'm trying to or try to do this as quickly as possible, just to draw two um, general structures of an amino acid in a peptide bond so that you can see what that looks like. Right. So over here is amy again um carbon ring carbo um, but in this case we're going to do something a little bit differently all right so in the peptide bond always remember that it is just a line and it's basically the carboxylic group is joined to the um, amine group of the next one so over here this is going to be our um made a bit of an error here that's going to be our amine group that we're joining to all right and it goes on so you more or less just to draw the same thing over again and the one end will be the carboxylic acid group and again you have the r and over here you have the h um, if you're wondering how this came about, please just go and watch. And obviously you have to add plus water. Um, please just go watch the videos on chapter two. They will help you a lot. Um, so if you look at the peptide bond, here is the peptide bond over here. Um, it contains four different atoms, it said. Um, that is correct because it does have um, the... It has the carbon, it has the hydrogen involved, it has the oxygen, and it also has um, the carbon as well, the nitrogen as well, sorry. So all of these here are making up our peptide bond together. So that would be that. It can be broken by the addition of water at room temperature. That is not correct. Um, you don't break the peptide bond by adding water at room temperature at least. It is important in the primary structure of proteins that is correct. Um, so here our answer then would be D, which is two and four. All right, let's look at the next one. 
So this is 14. Um, which graph correctly shows the activation energy of a reaction when an enzyme is added? So again, I want you to bear in mind what is happening here. When you're going through your paper one paper, you are actually working on, um, you're working chapter by chapter. So we've just finished chapters one and two, and now we're on chapter three. And we still have to go all the way to chapter 11. So I will try to speed this up. Which graph correctly shows the activation energy of a reaction when an enzyme is added? So first things first, um, sorry, I just hit my mic. I hope that didn't have a huge sound effect on your end. Um, so over here, let's first of all, just look at what our graphs are looking like. Graph C cannot be OK, so this cannot be a possibility. And I'm just going to tell you why very quickly, because it is showing us that the activation energy starts off low and then it increases um, even as we add the enzyme. But that's not what usually happens. So B and C cannot be correct simply because they have the wrong shape. So we are caught between A and D. Now, if we look at A, it says the energy starts high. All right. And it obviously goes that way. When you don't add an enzyme, it's higher. When you add an enzyme, it's lower. But it is telling us that the products are here, which is wrong. And the reactants are here at the bottom. Um, and that is not correct. So it can't be A. The answer would have to be D. OK, let's look at um, chapter um, question 15, rather. It says the enzyme lactase is found in the membranes of epithelial cells lining the small intestine or intestine. The enzyme is formed by a single polypeptide that folds to give three different regions, an active site with the free amino acid group outside the cell, a short section inside the membrane and a short section inside the cell. What type of amino acid would be found in each of the three regions? So we're looking at whether or not the amino acid would be a hydrophilic one or a hydrophobic one. So in this case, um, we can just quickly think quickly um, inside the membrane. When you think of the cell membrane, what do you think of? You think of phospholipid bilayers because the small intestine, by the way, is in an animal cell. Plant cells also have this, um, but we're dealing with an animal cell here. So we have phospholipid bilayers. What makes up the phospholipid bilayer? It is um, their phospholipids and they have fatty acid tails and phosphate heads that love water. But it says here inside the membrane. So it means that there's a section of the enzyme that's sitting inside here. For it to be sitting so comfortably inside a hydrophobic region, it must be hydrophobic itself. So that means that we can cross out section C because here where it says inside the membrane, option C is telling us that that amino acid must be hydrophilic, which is impossible. So we know that C is not a possible answer for us. OK, then let's look outside the cell. So if we are on the outside of the cell um, over here, um, the outside of the cell is hydrophilic because we are dealing with, for example, the small intestine environment. And in that environment, food passes through, water passes through, um, there are vitamins and all of these things that are absorbed there because of the water as well that helps to carry them through. So we know that that environment has to be um, hydrophilic, all right? And we know that usually cells are in a hydrophilic environment. For example, your cells are in the environment where your blood is carried and your blood has liquid, um, which is made up of water as well. So we know that it's a hydrophilic environment outside the cell. So that tells us that D cannot be our possible answer. So we've eliminated two. Um, and I'm using the process of elimination here because this is not something you're necessarily taught. You're trying to apply the knowledge you have gained in biology. So you can't just come in here and say, oh, I know, I know, I know, because it's not a matter of recalling a definition, for example. This is trying to apply what you understand by hydrophilic and hydrophobic, as well as the environments of cells. So we are left with only A or B. Now let's look at um, what A or B is. So we've already concluded what outside the cell is and we've concluded inside the membrane. Now inside the cell, we know that inside the cell is a hydrophilic environment actually because it's a cytoplasm, right? Um, it's usually the membrane itself that is hydrophobic. So inside the cell has to be a hydrophilic environment and that tells us that B cannot be the answer. So our answer here would have to be A. So I've just used the system of elimination here and I hope that you got it. If it was a little bit confusing for you, again, please just rewind it or post the question in the comments if you feel like you just really don't get it. All right. 
Um, now let's look at this one. I'm just going to erase here so you can see very clearly. Um, question 16, it says a student wrote three statements about cell signaling. A signal chemical always has the same shape as a protein receptor on a target cell. Um, this is not always the case um, because there are different types of protein receptors, so it doesn't really specify. So I'm very um, apprehensive about picking that answer. Um, two, an increase in temperature may decrease the effect of cell to cell signaling. That is indeed correct. Um, when you have a fever, for example, your cell signaling is affected, which is why in some cases, some people are unable to absorb food properly and you might find that people have diarrhea or people get constipated or things just don't work out as they should within the body. A mutation may decrease production of active protein receptors for the cell surface membrane. That is also true. And if you want to get more evidence on this, you should watch the video I did in chapter 15 about myasthenia gravis. Um, myasthenia gravis is a condition of the nervous system um, and you'll see there how this mutation, our mutation can result in that. Um, it's actually an autoimmune disease but I sort of hope that it gives you some clarity. So in this case I am more confident in picking two and three is the answer and I see that that was what was selected um, in the mark scheme as well. And the reason why A is not necessarily the answer he says it has the same shape as a protein receptor on a target cell, not as the protein receptor. So even though it's a target cell, it doesn't mean that's the only signal that it gets. It can get other signals, which means that it can have different types of protein receptors that respond to different signal chemicals. And just by the way, these signal chemicals are sometimes called ligands. Uh, please watch the video on chapter four for this um, so that you understand it. Let's look at 17 and 18. At which stages of mitosis are chromosomes composed of two chromatids that are held together by a centromere? So at what stage of mitosis basically are chromosomes still acting or looking like chromosomes and not separated into chromatids? So during anaphase, that's not correct. During telophase, also not correct. Because during that time, you're already pulling the chromatids apart in anaphase. And in telophase, the chromatids are sort of um, in separate cells of forming into separate cells. Um, anaphase, again, that can't be correct. Metaphase and prophase are chromosomes are still whole, so this is definitely an option. Metaphase and telophase, again, telophase not correct, so the answer here is C. Let's look at 18. The jellyfish Turritopsis dorni, that's interesting, is described as being immortal. Immortal means it doesn't die. So this could maybe make up a horror movie one day. If T. domi is not eaten by predators or diseased, it seems to be able to live forever. There is no way to determine the biological age of a T. domi individual. Which feature of the cells in T. domi could explain these observations? So for example, um, this is still on mitosis. Again, a good way for you to assess your paper one is to always ask yourself, what chapter are we on now? It starts off on, on chapter one and it goes sequentially all the way to chapter 11. So if you have that in mind, that might be helpful. So which feature of the cells in T. Domi could explain these observations? Um, very long G phases in the, in the cell cycle. Well, that's long growth phases, so that's not necessarily um, anything at all. Um, a very short S phase. Again, we don't know how that would help. The S phase is when you have your DNA replication, I believe. Um, and so that, again, doesn't really tell us anything. An ability to restore telomeres to their original length. Now, this is onto something because when we spoke about telomeres, when we were discussing this um, chapter, and again, go watch the videos on chapter five or the video on chapter five. You will recall that I said that the longer your telomeres are, the slower you age. And what I usually do in the classroom is I show my um, students photos of celebrities who seem to not be aging, like Pharrell, for example, he looks the same since, I don't know, 20 years ago. So an ability to restore telomeres to their original length prevents aging. And that means that it might make people immortal or make this organism in particular immortal. And that could be an interesting research for you to do if you do go into um, some form of genetics in your future. So I'll pick C as my answer. Fewer chromosomes than other eukaryotic organisms does not really tell us anything either. 
Okay, let's look at 19 and 20. Some chemicals used to stop tumor growths work by preventing the DNA double helix from uncoiling and separating. During what stage of the cell cycle would they act? So when you know that when DNA is uncoiling and separating, it is about to undergo replication. And so if these chemicals are preventing that from happening, they are happening during interphase because that is when you have DNA replication. Remember that interphase is made up of the G1 phase, the S phase, and the G2 phase. So interphase is what is being affected. We're halfway through. Let's look at this. Four nucleotides, A, B, C, and D, each consist of three phosphate groups, a nitrogenous base, and a pentose sugar. Characteristics of the base and sugar components before they are joined to form each nucleotide is shown in the table. Which nucleotide could pair with an adenine base during DNA replication? So we know that adenine in DNA will bind to timing. Um, so over here, what this is asking you to actually know are the structures of the different bases. So you need to know the structure of adenine, you need to know the structure of thymine, the structure of guanine, and the structure of cytosine. So if you recall the structures, and I'm sure that you don't, <laughs> because I'm sure some of you have never bothered to look at them, but please, this is an indication that you should, you'll know that adenine and guanine are the purines, all right? Um, so they are the purines, while thymine and cytosine are the pyrimidines. And a good way for me to remember this is I always just remember what their names are and the, not, the letters that make them up. So thymine has a Y, so the cytosine has a Y. Adenine and guanine end in um, INE, and they don't have Ys, more or less. This makes sense to me, it might not to you. So that's one way to just remember. The purines have two ring structures, so they have double ring structures, while the pyrimidines, which is thymine, has a single ring structure. So we already know that A and B cannot be our answer. Okay, so it can't be A or B because it's telling us here that the ring structures are double, which we know that for adenine binding to thymine, thymine doesn't have a double ring structure. We can then look at um, the last two, which then tell us um, the single ring structures. And then you have to figure out the ratio of carbon to oxygen atoms in the pentose sugar. So in the pentose sugar for um, for guanine, um, for sorry, for thymine, it's five for um, what's it called? For purines, it's actually five, um, two, four, four at for thymine, I believe. Um, I'm not really sure about this, but the answer is D. Um, when you look at the, the different ratio of carbon to oxygen atoms in the pentose sugar for the two of them, adenine has five and thymine has four, I believe. So, but please check on that. Okay, let's move quickly along. The statements describe the process of translation. And the question is, in which order does this process take place? Um, so you're simply trying to rearrange this process in order to get the correct order. So if you look at these, it says a peptide bond forms between adjacent amino acids, hydrogen bonds form between the anticodon and the codon, mRNA binds to the ribosome, tRNA enters the ribosome carrying a specific amino acid. Now, First things first, watch chapter six if you haven't in order to get an idea of protein synthesis. Uh, but also when you're answering questions like this, my advice is always that you read every single possible, um, every single option that has been given to you so that you can arrange with good information in mind. So don't just start by, you know, guessing. So we know that in this regard, mRNA would bind to the ribosome first because it leaves the nucleus and comes to the ribosome. And then tRNA would come carrying um, an amino acid. We know that hydrogen bonds will form between the codon on mRNA and the anticodon on tRNA. And then we know there'll be a peptide bond that is formed between the adjacent amino acids. So that tells us that three is our very first one. So it cancels out C and D. Um, as possibilities and um, so three and then it goes to um, four over here so look at the numbers in red not the ones here the numbers in red so this is one two so over here it would be three four goes to two and then goes to one so our correct answer here is b 22 the sequence of amino acids in the section of a polypeptide is histidine proline aspartic acid and leucine 
what is the correct sequence of mRNA codons for this polypeptide section. So now, in this case, it's simply telling you to transcribe the DNA you've been given into mRNA. And you can tell um, in this case, just by looking at the options, which option you can kick out first, you have to go and look at the options that have thymine because the question is asking you for mRNA codons. So any option with thymine is impossible because we know that in thymine, the, in, in RNA, there is no thymine. There is only uracil. Okay, so we know that option C is out of the question. Then we can then look at the sequence of amino acids that we've been given and try to transcribe those. So because we've been given two different possibilities, we have to write two sequences for each amino, um, for each chain. So in this case, we have histidine as the first one. So histidine here is GTA and GTG. So that means our first sequence, GTA, if we transcribe that to mRNA, it would be C. A, U, and the second possibility there would be C, A, C. So again, just by looking at this C, A, U, C, A, C, we can see that we have that with options A or B, but we don't have that with D, so we can just go ahead and cancel D out of the question. But obviously, if you're doing this cancellation thing that I do, make sure that you are very sure of what you have done so that you're not cancelling something that might be correct. I am very sure of the transcription I've just done for histidine. That is why I have cancelled. Proline is our next one. So proline, if we go at proline, we can see there are two options again, GGA and GGG. So GGA in DNA will become CCU in RNA and it would be CCC for the second possibility. So again, let's just look at that. We have CCC and we also have CCU. So still A or B fighting very hard for this, um, for this uh, answer. Aspartic acid here, we have CTA and CTG. CTA would become G, A, U, all right? Um, while CTG would become G A C. Okay, so we can see that we have that here C A U C C. Okay, so over here we have C A U C C U, and this is G A U, that's G A C. So hmm, something's looking a little bit off. Um, but let's see over here. The last one is leucine. And in leucine, we have GAT and GAC. So let's look at that. GAT would be C U A. And um, GAC would be C U G. Okay, so here we have GAC, C U G. But it seems as though there's been some interchange between these two, because if you look at this, we have this um, first two, um, CAU and CCU, they are correct over here. CAC and CCC are also correct over here. However, the correct sequence for sure is GAC or GAU. Now, this doesn't give us either of those two, but this does. It gives us a GAC. Then when we look further, it says CUA or CUG. Now CUG is here, but remember the sequence here is incorrect. So already A is incorrect and CUA is here. What this simply has shown is that just because the triplet codes, and, uh, um, for example, in section two, doesn't mean they follow that exact um, sequence. What it's telling you is that this might be the correct triplet code for some amino acids, while the correct triplet code for another amino acid might come from the second section. So in this case, the answer would be A because it is the one that represents all of the amino acids correctly. Sorry, it would be B, I meant to say B not A. I hope that was clear. If it wasn't, I am willing to expatiate on that in a different video. Let's look at 23. What contributes to the upward movement of water in the xylem vessel of a plant? Number one, the cohesion of water molecules. That's definitely correct. Um, cohesion is a very big factor. Addition of water molecules to the cellular cell walls. That's also correct. Removal of water from xylem vessels in the leaf reduces the hydrostatic pressure. That is also correct. And that would be A. 
please check the videos on chapter 7 for clarity on that one. Let's look at 24. The diameter of a tree trunk usually decreases slightly during the day. Which changes in environmental factors during the day could cause the diameter to decrease even more? So the diameter of a tree trunk um, is more or less speaking about the, the body of the, of the tree. Right, and this question is asking us which factors could lead to um, a decrease in that. So the body of the tree um, is most likely responding, for example, to the amount of water that's flowing through the xylem. So then when there's one more water flowing through the xylem, um, you might have an increased diameter or when there's less water, you might have a decreased diameter. So in this case, you're thinking of the factors that would affect transpiration. So for example, if you have increased light intensity, you might affect transpiration because it would occur faster. So the roots will lose water, um, will take up water faster, but the water would be lost really quickly. Increased wind speed, wind speed also means water would be lost quickly. Increased temperature also means water would be lost really quickly. And all of these contributes to the reduction in the diameter of the tree trunk. So the answer here would be D. All right. This is a question that I believe many students don't like, and I wish I could explain it in more detail. But for this question, what you do need to know is what the structures of stems and leaves and roots look like. And I hope I believe those are in your textbook. So please, by all means, have a look at them. But the answer in this case um, is B. All right. Um, that's where you would find the phloem, this section over here, there. That's where you would find your phloem cells. Let's look at 26. Um, the diagram shows a xerophytic leaf in different conditions P and Q. So in P, um, we can see over here, so this is P, we can see that the region becomes a bit curved shaped. And in Q, the region is maybe a bit flatter um, based on how it's drawn anyway. Which statements describe the difference between the cells in layer Y in conditions P and Q? So in this case, you're dealing with a xerophyte. For those who might not know, xerophytes are cells that live in water stressed conditions and are able to survive. Um, so here we are trying to figure out what is causing, um, for example, the shrinkage over here. Okay, so here more negative water potential in P than in Q. Um, that's a possibility. So that means there's less water available. So that's why we have the shrinking. More cells are plasmolized in P. Um, that's also a possibility. So remember what plasmolysis is. If you've watched the videos on chapter four on osmosis, you remember that plasmolysis is more like the shrinking of the cytoplasm. Cells are less turgid in Q. I don't believe so because Q looks like a healthier, well-rounded shape. Water potential becomes zero in Q. Um, well, not really sure about that either, um, but that could be a possibility, um, but just not sure. And again, there are no options that give you one, two, and Four as possibilities, the only possibility you have is um, one and two as the correct answers. We know three definitely is wrong. Two and four only can't be correct because one is certainly correct. Um, three is also wrong again, so that means that your answer here would be B. Different substances such as sucrose and amino acids can move in different directions in fluem sieve tubes. Um, which statements explains this? So remember that in your xylem, water moves in a single direction, so it goes upwards, whereas in phloem, um, the, the sap, I was about to say the sucrose, the sap moves in all directions. So what statement would explain um, this movement? So one, um, A says active transport occurs in some fluems, fluem sieve tube elements and mass flow occurs in others. That's not true. Um, they all have mass flow. And because it also differentiates, that's not true. Both active transport and mass flow occur in each individual sieve tube element. That again is not true. Mass flow occurs in both directions at the same time in each individual um, sieve element. So what is both directions? It could be left and right. It could be up and down. That again is not true. 27D, um, mass flow occurs in different directions and different sieve el tube elements at the same time. This is the correct answer. And I know for some of you, that's just like, ha, ha, ha. That again is another reason I advise students before you go into your biology exam, make sure you're well rested and you have eaten so that you can see clearly. And I don't mean eat like a, a mound of bread where you finish eating and you just fall asleep. Eat enough to nourish your body and stay awake. 
Okay, let's look at 28, and we're very close to the end. I think we have 12 questions after this. The statements list some of the events in a cardiac cycle. The statements are not in correct order. Which statement describes the fourth of these events to occur in the cardiac cycle? So again, to know the cardiac cycle, watch the videos on chapter 8. Um, but here it says... Impulse travels through the porcine tissue. I know that's not the first thing that happens. A wave of excitation um, sweeps across the atria. Um, that's um, where it starts, I believe, that it does start at the atria. Um, the atria will then contract. Um, once the atria contract, the, um, let's see, once the atria contract, I believe it's the sinoatrial node that would then contract next. I might be wrong for this. Um, and then the atrioventricular node will delay the impulse for a fraction of a second. And then the wave of excitation sweeps upward from the base of the ventricles. The ventricles will then contract. Um, and then the impulse travels through the porcine tissue. I know I've gotten one of this wrong because I think the sinoatrial node would contract before the atria contract, but I am very sure that the atrioventricular node would be um, the fourth thing. So in this case, that would be number three. Um, so yeah, this should be correct. But please check out the sequence in chapter eight. I've been speaking for an hour, so this is a bit, is getting a little bit difficult. And by now, if you were writing this paper, you should be done. Which row correctly identify components of both lymph and tissue fluid? So the components of lymph and tissue fluid, so both of them together. Um, in this case, let's see, antibodies are certainly in, um, in both of them. So it's present, antibodies are present because these are part of the things that make up the blood, by the way. So because it says it's absent in these two, that means we know that C and D are not possibilities, all right? Um, and then let's keep going. Red blood cells are not present in either, but here it says red blood cells are present. So we know that A is certainly not our answer, and our answer here would then be B. Which row is correct for the mean blood pressure in different parts of the human circulatory system? Um, so the mean blood pressure um, in the circulatory system, and it's asking us in different, like the right atrium, the artery in the arm, um, the vein in the arm, and the capillary in the arm. First things first, this is not something you might know off the bat. You might not know what the pressure is. But one thing that you can always bet on is that the pressure is really low in the veins and it is also low in the capillaries. All right. So if you have that in mind, um, you would you would be better. OK, so in this case here, let's look at this in the right atrium. Um, the pressure is not necessarily high. Because um, the atria contract and then they relax. So I would say that um, A is looking good at the moment. And then the artery in the arm, because the arteries carry blood away from the heart, the pressure might be high. It doesn't specify which arm. So that again might be a little bit um, confusing for students. But again, I'll go with this, that the artery in the arm would have a high pressure. And you can see that these two are also saying the same thing. Um, I'm looking at A and B as possibilities now because this is telling us the atrium have really high, um, really high pressure. So I'm not really a fan of, I'm not, I don't think that's true. So C and D for me are already wrong. And again, I just want to say, because um, in this question paper, I have marked C and D as wrong a lot. So please don't go into your exam and be like C and D must be wrong and then just mark them wrong. This is based on the knowledge and the information. All right. Um, and then the vein in the arm, you know that the vein would have a low pressure. Um, doesn't necessarily have a high pressure. So I would go that with the vein in the arm, um, perhaps being somewhere between, somewhere here, um, because this is high, all right? This is high blood pressure. So I don't think that that would be correct. Although I have to say that I am surprised by the capillary in the arm um, having such high pressure. But in this case, I think because three of them are correct here, for me, I would go with A, all right? 
which mechanism accounts for the way most of the carbon dioxide is transported in the blood. Um, so in this case, carbon dioxide dissolves in plasma and is carried in a solution, not true. Um, convert it to carbino hemoglobin inside red blood cells, that's true, but that's not the way most of the carbon dioxide is transported. Um, convert it to carboxy hemoglobin inside red blood cells, well, that's not, ex that's not a desirable um, effect per se. Convert it to hydrogen carbonate ions, um, that is correct, so I would go with D here. The diagram, the graph shows the dissociation curves for hemoglobin at two different partial pressures of carbon dioxide. At which position A, B, C, or D is the concentration of hemoglobinic acid lowest in the red blood cells? So hemoglobinic acid is what is formed when you release, um, when you convert carbon dioxide into hydrogen ions and um, hydrocarbonate ions. And then the hydrogen ions combine with hemoglobin to form hemoglobinic acid. So just to get clarity on this, please, by all means, watch the videos on chapter eight. But your answer here would be C, um, because at C, you would have, um, first of all, lower concentrations of, you would have lower concentrations of hydrogen ions being formed. Um, and so for that reason, you would have, um, what's it called now? You would have less hemoglobinic acid. Um, and in this case, obviously, there is more oxygen that's being bound. So C would be a better answer than D um, because D is showing that less oxygen is being bound because the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is high. The table shows the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and oxygen in two blood vessels. So here we have in the pulmonary artery, so that's the artery that carries blood from the heart to the lungs, and you have in the pulmonary vein that carries blood from the lungs back to the heart. What explains the difference in the partial pressures of oxygen in the artery and the vein? So if you look at the partial pressure of oxygen in particular, so if you look at oxygen in the pulmonary artery, over here, it is low, it is at 5 compared to the vein where it is at 15. The explanation for this is that the pulmonary artery carries blood away from the heart to the lungs. So the blood that it is taking to the lungs is blood that has a higher concentration of CO2 and you can consider it to be deoxygenated blood. The blood that is carried by the pulmonary vein is coming from the lungs. And remember when you breathe in air, the oxygen is going to the lungs in order to oxygenate the blood, which means that oxygen would be of a higher partial pressure when it is coming back to the heart through the pulmonary vein. So if we look at the options here, um, let's just see. 33, oxygen diffuses from the alveoli into the blood and the capillaries. Um, that's definitely a possibility. Carbon dioxide diffuses into the alveoli um, from the blood. That doesn't tell us anything about oxygen. Um, so we can just cancel out the ones that are focusing on CO2. Oxygen diffuses from the body cells into the blood and the capillaries. That again is not true. So in this case, our answer is A. Number 34. Which graph shows the effect of carbon monoxide on the percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen? Um, now, with this one, so just look at the key very carefully. With carbon monoxide is the dotted line, and without carbon monoxide is the straight line. So always remember that carbon monoxide binds with hemoglobin irreversibly. It is very poisonous to the body, and it can lead to death um, if people are exposed to it for extended periods of time. So that means that the percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen will reduce if, ox if hemoglobin is binding with carbon monoxide monoxide. All of this is explained in chapter 8, so again, please have a look at that. But in this case, it can't be B because B is sort of suggesting that with carbon monoxide, the, partial, the percentage saturation of hemoglobin is higher. Here, it is showing that the percentage saturation is lower, but it's still sort of suggesting that it catches up as partial pressure of oxygen increases. That is not true. Carbon monoxide is like, um, is not a, is a, non-competitive inhibitor, so it affects the shape of hemoglobin. So even if you increase the partial pressure of oxygen, it doesn't mean hemoglobin would be able to bind to oxygen, so it is very damaging. In this case, it suggests that it is higher with carbon monoxide, which is not true, so your answer is A. 
All right, we're very close to the end. These are the last few questions, and these videos are really long, um, but I hope that they're very helpful for you. Um, which row contains the correct methods of transmission of the named pathogens? So methods of transmission, um, let's look at the pathogens. Mobili virus, um, is it by airborne droplets? First of all, what does Mobili virus do? I believe that's the one that's responsible for measles. Um, so I don't think that A is correct. It's not necessarily by airborne droplets, but let's see. Mycobacterium, insect vector, that's not true. Vibrio cholera A, um, that's definitely um, a possibility. The insect vector would be plasmodium. That's the most common one for malaria. Vibrio, true dirty water. Mycobacterium, true air droplets. This is looking good. So I'll put a tick next to B. A, not so much. Um, airborne droplets for plasmodium, that's not true. So we don't need to bother with C. Airborne droplets for Vibrio, you can't get cholera um, by someone sneezing on you per se. So that's not correct. So our answer here is B. Which disease is caused by a eukaryote? So for um, when you do infectious diseases, you will learn about, or if you haven't done it, um, just go watch the videos on chapter 10, I believe, because I did do um, some summary of the different types of infectious diseases. But the one that is a eukaryote here is the one that causes malaria. Um, all of these are prokaryotes, um, just by the way, prokaryotes or viruses. But this one here is caused by a eukaryote. Okay, let's get through the last four questions. So here, what is the initial mechanism by which bacteria become resistant to antibiotics? Um, so just looking at this quickly, I can already see overuse of antibiotics is wrong because the question asks you for the mechanism. It doesn't ask you for the cause. So the mechanism means what the bacteria itself undergoes in order to become resistant. So it can't be overuse and it also can't be patients not finishing a cause, um, a cause of antibiotics because then that is a causative um, issue. Natural selection, but what would be required for natural selection to happen? So natural selection can't be the mechanism, the initial mechanism it is, it has to be genetic mutation. The genetic mutation will then lead to natural selection, so the answer here is A. What are the functions of T lymphocytes? T lymphocytes can either be helper T cells or they can be killer T cells. So always bear that in mind that um, your immune system has um, some killers in it. Um, the helper T cells produce cytokines whenever there is an invader in the body. So when a pathogen invades the body, they produce cytokines. The killer T cells produce toxins to kill certain kinds of invaders. Um, and the helper T cells can also recognize an antigen bound to an antigen presenting cell. So in this case, the answer would be A. All right, now the last two questions. What is, co what is correct about the role of memory cells in long-term immunity? So they divide to form plasma cells and memory cells when the pathogen enters the body a second time. That is true because they help with the, anti the quick antibody production. That is why you have the secondary immunity. And I suggest you watch the video on how vaccines work because I think that would be very helpful for you. They produce a fast response so that the person infected with the pathogen does not become ill again. That's also true. They produce more antibodies that were produced during the primary immune response. Now, they don't necessarily produce more antibodies, but they do respond faster. The antibodies respond faster. Um, they remain in the blood and lymphatic system after the pathogen has been destroyed. That is also true. So in this case, we have one, two, and four. Which events result, and yay, it's the last one. Which events result in a person developing actively acquired immunity? I'm not going to go into detail about what active acquired immunity is. Please, please watch the video on um, how vaccines work because I do explain it a bit there. So I think that would help. And then watch the videos on chapter 11 on immunity. Um, so for number 40, becoming infected by TB bacteria, um, that would definitely be an active um, acquisition. Drinking breast milk, that is passive, so that can't be the answer. Um, removing, receiving an injection of antigens, that is actively acquired. Receiving an injection of antibodies, that is passively acquired. And so our answer here would be C. 
And so that brings us to the end of this paper, which was quite long, and I hope that you followed through to the end. Um, I hope that you've solved these questions before watching this video, and I think I should have said that at the beginning. But if you didn't, I still hope it was good revision for you. The next video I will do again, focusing on the October-November prep group, will be paper two from May, June 2021, and doing variant one of this paper. Again, these are the only papers I'm going to do, papers one, one, two, four, and five, May, June, variant one only. I believe that by just going through those and you practicing on your own, you will be able to answer a lot more past questions and be able to do your revision effectively. Um, if I start to post any concept revision videos, perhaps like short videos on YouTube um, to help you just remember certain terms, then um, just make sure you follow with that, um, follow that and maybe try to answer some of the questions I'll be posting, but I don't know when I'll be able to get to that. So for now, make sure you're practicing, doing your best and preparing hard for the exams. I wish you guys good luck. All the best. Goodbye.